Rohini Nilekani is a thoughtful and intuitive philanthropist. She is an author, journalist, columnist, television anchor, a punster, a funster and a champion of wildlife. She combines a deep empathy for all species great and small with a sharp, quick and curious mind. Her love for nature and the outdoors is infectious and she's perhaps most comfortable in her beloved forests and mountains wearing her trademark trademark cap and carrying her binoculars. For all these we are very grateful and delighted to have you Rohini in this podcast. Welcome to the Bird Podcast. I'm Shobha Narayan. With us today is Rohini Nilekani to talk about nature and birding. Welcome Rohini. Thank you so much Shobha for having me on the podcast. Very much looking forward to our conversation. Us too. Um Rohini my first question is that I know you love wildlife and you um in our show notes section we have linked to the recent video documentaries you have done about Blacky aka Karia both ep- uh, parts 1 and 2 but tell us about your experience and engagement with birds Yeah thank you Shobha so actually I was since I was born and brought up in Mumbai I think around me the only birds we saw were crows and sparrows mainly and parakeets so in that experience i didn't have too many birds around me but i did spend all my vacations in dahanu at my grandparents home north of bombay very close in the forests of the western ghats and there of course there were just birds the minute you woke up till till you slept at night the night jar so a little bit of the introduction to birds happened then in my childhood vacations and when we went to the karnala bird sanctuary near bombay for picnics but even then i really began to take it seriously only when my children were very small and once we had gone out for a picnic near bangalore and um, i didn't i wasn't at all um, knowledgeable about bird species and i just pointed out a bird to interest my children and um the name that it was a cattle egret and not just an egret was pointed out to be my my guest and i said oh there's much more to know and then from that day on i got hooked i bought my first bird book and i started telling my children about it and when the children were very small shobha you may recall perhaps sometimes it gets very lonely you're looking for something to turn to and my birding experience which started then really transported me to a to a special place and i've not looked back since you've gone to many of my dream birding spots including valparai in fact you told me if i want to see hornbills i should go to valparai can you pick some spots of the so for foreign listeners who ha- don't know india which are some of your favorite spots that you would point to yeah well all the forests you know india is so rich in bird life I mean wherever you go right in my garden I have recorded 55 species and I bet there are more that I haven't found so wherever you go in India Shobha the birds are with you all the time but yeah um some of my more memorable trips were um to Sikkim and um uh, to the whole uh, to Uttarakhand and we went uh, of course even Goa strangely and many places in tamil nadu including valparai of course in kabini where i spent a lot of time looking at birds the forests of karnataka um in the andamans uh in kerala of course i mean honestly in the western ghats almost anywhere in the western ghats so um and along our coastline i mean the water birds along all our coastlines so actually i don't know where to stop so i'll just stop here <laughs> uh Rohini you're not only a bird lover and a bird watcher and encompassing all wildlife but you also um, are a philanthropist in that area uh recently you have given specifically for a bird project to the Na- nature conservation foundation ncf can you tell us a little bit about that and what it is and why you did it right so um having observed how you know having birds all around us birds are the easiest way to start connecting with nature and the wild right from little children to older people because birds are ubiquitous and birds are always fascinating to human beings because they fly right they fly all around you and the first thing a child wants to do is fly like a bird 
And so because I'm so interested in getting more people connected to the wild, because I really think the future of humanity almost depends on many of us getting engaged with nature and the wild, birds seem to be a really good segue into that. So wanted to see how I can support the efforts of many NGOs, but especially Nature Conservation Foundation, to create an India-wide interest in birds and do it strategically and systematically over many years. So it's a multi-year grant to increase interest and build the capacity of people to appreciate birds, to understand birds, to observe them, to protect them, to get involved in bird conservation. And for that also build the capacity of citizen scientists, maybe build the capacity of people to do courses in uh, bird watching, ornithology, so that in every tourist destination in India, because there are birds everywhere, you can hire local experts to take you birding. It's also going to create so many livelihoods. Birding has taken on, taken off so well in India. And uh, so find a way to get people involved in simple ways in bird conservation because birds are literally like the canaries in the mind, <laughs> literally and figuratively, right? So when we know what's happening to birds, we also know what's going to happen to ourselves. So that was the intent and it's been a lot of work has already begun. The pandemic set us back a bit, but it will pick up speed. And I really hope uh, we can create a network of organizations across the country supporting this effort. And I hope more philanthropists will join in. Um, thank you. In the show notes section of the episode, we are going to link to a very lyrical column you wrote about the Black Panther for Mint. Um, but in that, you talk about nature as a way of finding yourself. I mean, you're a nature enthusiast. Um, can you elaborate a little bit on that? What do you mean by that? Why is it so? Why should people care? Yeah. Uh, one is, of course, there's just more and more data. Shobha, you know that as well as I do on how just exposure to nature, you know, mindful exposure to nature they have been literally able to link it with health parameters. And the Japanese, as you know, Shinrin no Yoku, the forest bathing that they have adopted like as a whole nation, especially because uh, uh, Japan is so urban, for urban people to be able to go out into the forest, they have found enough correlation between human health, human happiness, human peace of mind, and just soaking in nature, right? And doing it in a mindful way, not just going there to open a few cans of Coca-Cola and chips or something, but to do it as to reconnect with the wild because we seem to be quite deracinated. In urban areas, sometimes you don't see, you don't get a chance to explore all the wonderful mysteries of nature. So I feel that when I go out into the forest, and especially as I get older, perhaps, um, I feel the possibility of expanding myself and of quieting myself at the same time. And first, you're just enraptured by all the sounds and the sights, right? Especially the birds always making some interesting sound or the other right around you. And then the sight of their beauty. But after that, you sort of get into a kind of a stillness. It's almost meditative. And you come, you can't help but feeling restored. Even the most cynical people and blasé people I have um, lured into the forests have come back slightly hooked and wanting to go again. So there is some magic to forests and it's been written about for thousands of years, so it's nothing new. But what needs to be renewed is the urgency by which it becomes a very broad-based project especially to introduce urban children to the wild, especially to take them into nature in a mindful way. Yeah, yeah. My next question was to be, what are the pleasures of nature? But you've answered it already. Um, do you remember, do you have anecdotes about specific locations and specific birds that you enjoyed maybe? Um, I mean, everybody... Yeah, I'm sure everybody has their favorite moments, but... I must say I was gobsmacked by the sight of the fire-tailed sunbird in Sikkim. I had gone with Dr. Kamal Bhava of Atri, the founder of Atri, and um, 
his beloved Sikkim was being introduced to my, my husband, Nandan and me. We were in the Lachung Valley, I think more towards Yumtang. And the rhododendrons were out. It was summer. It was gorgeous. And I knew that there were some really spectacular birds. But when I saw that fire-tailed sunbird, I mean, I just, literally my jaw dropped. It is a bird of such spectacular beauty. And um, I spent so many hours just looking out for it and watching it. So it was completely unforgettable. And like that, there are so many. I went to Bhutan and found the Monal pheasant, which I found very fascinating. And uh, then, of course, I have a long list of favorite birds <laughs> that, uh, you know, the heart-spotted woodpecker. Have you seen the heart-spotted woodpecker in Kabini? It's quite it's delicate and so beautiful. I mean, all the woodpeckers, frankly, the white-bellied woodpecker. And of course, who cannot say something about the paradise flycatchers with their long white ribbons and the golden oreos that come and sit in Bangalore right outside our bedroom windows, right? And the blue-capped rock thrush. I know these migrant birds, they really, I really respect them because they fly on such little lungs all the way to come and meet us. And just seeing them, then... Nobody can forget to mention the hornbills, right? I mean, they're so magnificent. And, but I, honestly, almost all birds. I can't think of a bird that I don't like. Sometimes you get a bit irritated with the quails who insist on waking up at 3 a.m. But, but otherwise, really, I really like all the birds, even the little brown jobs, because they, as they call them, because you have to work so hard to identify them. Yes, yes. Well, wow, my pet peeve is with the rock pigeons that are all around us in uh, in Bangalore. Yeah, you know, Bombay right? Mumbai cars that really don't like them at all because they create so much trouble. Yeah, um, Rohini, um, uh, are there some sort of destinations that uh, you would like to go to? Is there a bucket list, for example, or bird species that uh, you would like to see, or country? Yeah, definitely. I want to go to Papua New Guinea. We have to see all the birds of paradise. Um, I mean, I do want, you know, I've been so often to North America, but not spent too much time, even though I was near Audubon, I did not spend too much time birding. And I would like to catch up with that, even in North America. And then... Um, uh, you mentioned NCF. Uh, they are doing a project with the Narcodam hornbills that's been yes. written about. And that's sort of an island in the middle of the ocean. Right. Uh, and that's a separate subspecies of hornbill, right? Yes. Yeah. Yes, yes. It would be lovely to go there. I mean, in India, of course, there are many destinations. I haven't even properly explored Kutch in uh, India itself. So, yes. you know, there are many many places. The Bunny the Grasslands of Kutch is a great place for um, uh, certain species, I'm told. Yeah, I've, I've also not gone there. Rohini, much of your work is embedded in community. Is there a way you can link community and birding and things changing? Yeah. No, I think it's very important for Samaj or society and its institutions to get very involved with conserving our birds. They provide so many ecosystem services that we don't think about. They are seed dispersers, they are scavengers, they clean up stuff for us. Uh, they actually help build out our forests, right, by dispersing seeds. They play a very critical role in the environment. And unless society itself gears itself up locally in their context, uh, to protect birds, our 867 known species of birds in India, 25% um, of them are already somewhat endangered, as are the global birds. So obviously society, Samad, which I care about a lot, I care about citizen action a lot. And in India, we have lots of evidence that local people protect their local birds. You obviously know about Kokre Bellur here in Karnataka, where the migrant painted stalks and pelicans that come along, spot belly, spot belly pelicans, are vigorously defended by the local people. And they make sure that the areas where the birds uh, roost and nest are very much protected even during that agricultural season. So that's one great example. And then the other example, which has probably gone viral all over the world is that of the Amur falcon that migrates through India and through the work of many conservationists. Now in Pangti, the local tribals who used to eat and ca catch and trap and 
catch and eat the birds uh, have now kind of signed up to protect them. And that is such a heartwarming story. And you'll find such stories everywhere because uh, we have really respected birds throughout our history and mythology, birds as the vahanas and vehicles of all our gods and goddesses described in all our marvelous temples and sculptures around the country thousand years uh, ago um, in the Hampi area the migratory birds are drawn out in stone so that respect that understanding of birds has always been there and that's why today's digital samaj the new citizenry also needs to reconnect and they can do it in so many more ways now than our uh, our ancient uh, uh, people um, who didn't have the means of communication that we have today. So there's a lot of hope and that's the kind of work I love to support. Rohini, um, you think very strategically and you also do big picture and micro. In your mind, is shifting edu- is education uh, the problem to solve with respect to wildlife? Is it protecting infrastructure corridors? Is it government policy? I mean, which one would you attack first um, if it were up to you? I think obviously it needs to be done on all fronts, Shobha. But I think awareness, because I like to start my work from the Samaj side, I think building more awareness, really good storytelling matters. And so one of the things I like to do is support. We have such marvelous young filmmakers who are now doing a lot of documentation of our birds, our wetland birds and forest birds. And I think they have learned to tell stories very powerfully. And we should never underestimate the power of storytelling. And you can tell lovely stories about birds. In fact, the earliest stories that we told our children was about the thirsty crow, right? I don't know a single mother in India who has not told the story of the thirsty crow. And there are many such stories building up now through excellent documentaries. So for me, storytelling awareness and secondly creating more and more opportunities to take young people out into the wild and there's this whole new thing coming up shobha you may be aware of it of a new um, startups are coming up to begin a culture of camping like in the west people go out in india there are so many places that you could start that and if you do it with an ecological sensibility and an ecological intelligence i think you can create a bigger and better community that is much more connected to the wild and therefore to our sustainable future. Uh, Your husband once mentioned the word aspirational economy to sort of pinpoint the trajectory at which India is in the graph. uh, As an aspirational economy, how are we going to make time for wildlife? And why is, I mean, why, why is it important? How can we do it? See, if we don't, it is really at our own peril. It is very high risk for us to think, to not understand how much, even if our aspirations are economic aspirations, if we don't understand very clearly that the eco- ecology is the, the big set, right? The ecology is a subset, the, sorry, the economy is a subset of the ecology. Even the economy derives a lot of services from the ecology. And if we don't protect that, and climate change is such a huge factor. And our country has um, stepped up to, to with some very uh, aggressive, nationally determined contribution goals. And we are very much aware that our future prosperity is linked to our ability to conserve our ecology. Now, there are always going to be trade-offs. But I think if we keep the big picture moving towards conservation, towards um, uh, sort of uh, re-energizing people's uh, connect with the wild, then I think prosperity itself will become redefined. Today, if we everything is defined in monetary terms, right? We want people to from the villages to come into urban areas. So what are they leaving behind? Good water, clean air, right? Um, trees, forests. And what are we bringing them into? I think some of those things are going to become more valuable as time goes by. And you will sort of have a refashioned economy as well that takes into account some of these um, positive values of nature. 
I remember you said after coming from Kabini that you are so fed up of the urban jungle and you can't wait to go back to the real jungle. <laughs> um, Rohini, you bring up ecology and economy. So let me ask you about the whole ecology. Tell us about Karia. Tell us you love mammals too. You love uh, you love all things great and small. But tell us about this romancing that you have going on with the Black Panther. It's very true that... Uh... For some reason, I allowed myself to sort of uh, get attracted to this single one animal as a kind of a teacher for myself because it is only a black cat, okay? It genuinely is only a black cat. But I invested some things in this animal uh, mostly to allow myself to grow. Uh, the poor fellow has no clue that I exist, correctly so. <laughs> but because it took me years to find him, and uh, so that in the in that thrill of that chase, I also was able to learn a lot about the forest, about the interdependence of every the tiniest of those carpenter bees through the birds, through the bears, through the cats and everything else and the trees and the seasons. And it taught me so much that chase for this one black animal that um, I really began to see him as someone who help me on my own path towards uh, peace and more knowledge and renewed wonder. So I'm very grateful to this Black Panther who doesn't know that I exist. And every time I see him, I really feel something a little undes indescribable. And I'm not alone. He has many, many, many fans. So <laughs> there's something rather special about this particular Black Panther or so some of us think. So, But it, this romance with this Black Panther has really allowed me to understand so much and be so humble about how little we understand about the complex connections on which we are all dependent. And especially during this pandemic, right? When especially birds, by the way, um, birds, zoonotic diseases and birds and us are totally linked since we are talking about birds. So I got a chance while I was sitting there in that forest waiting for hours for this animal to turn up to think about all these links, marvel at them, but also recommit myself to not just supporting more conservation efforts, but also telling my story more wild, more widely. I said wildly, but I didn't mean wildly so much as wildly. <laughs> yeah, maybe that's so that, so that and more people hopefully <laughs> can begin to sense some of that wonder and joy that I have had the extraordinary privilege to be able to experience. And the beauty, Rohini, is that this is accessible. As you say, it is you go to villages. This is wildlife is ours to keep to find and keep. Yes, just like there are birds absolutely everywhere, right? Um, there are animals everywhere because we, again, I feel so proud to belong to a country where in spite of so much land pressure and population pressure, we have kept our biodiversity of flora and fauna alive, right? And even though, yes, birds are on the decline, there are many other species that are thriving and being supported by people. And despite having one third the land of America, probably one fourth that of China, the kind of coexistence that we have practiced that is under threat now. But even then, people are beginning to see how can we have peaceful coexistence with wildlife? How much can we tolerate? How much will we be able to tolerate? Uh, and I believe in the precautionary principle. Um, it's easy for me to say because I live very safely. So I respect those who are in the path of danger and I'm not expecting them to leave man-eating cats alive or anything like that. But um, how can we tread more lightly on this planet? And because precautionary principle means we don't really understand the connections. We don't know how many species are needed to keep this whole web together, right? So every apart from the moral right, of species to live on their own. There is also this serious existential question of how much of the biodiversity we really need in order for our next generations to be able to live and thrive. Yeah. 
in Kashmir, a naturalist pointed to a house that was placed on the water. It was entirely made of wood and connected. And he said, you can keep taking one piece of wood out and maybe nothing will happen. But then one piece you pull out and the house will collapse. And with what we are doing with wildlife, we don't know when that one piece exactly. will collapse. It's exactly what you just said. There is one um, piece stone, one cornerstone, something that yes. is the most important element, but we don't know what that is. Yes. So yes. hence the precautionary principle. And when you tie that just with an, as I say, if you go with a humble heart and a scientist mind, then you get this sense of continuously renewing wonder and more as you get to know a little more. So you combine these two things and it makes it worth everyone's while to keep trying to go out into the wild. Yeah. So Rohini, your Argyam Foundation has taken on water as a principle to conserve and protect. What should we all be doing to conserve birds? If you could wave your magic wand, what would be few things? Yeah. First of all, I think to be able to conserve and protect, you have to observe and love. So wherever, even if you have a small balcony with one single pot in it, you will see what happens if you plant the right things that will attract the birds. If not, keep a bowl of water. Just one bowl of water on one ledge outside your kitchen window. Create something for the birds, especially in summer. Do that you know, here in my little garden, I planted bushes that attract birds for nesting, uh, for um, hiding, for roosting, for perching. Everyone can do small things like that to help birds just be and survive and thrive. And secondly, all over the country, there are good conservation organizations from very small to very large. Find someone in your local area. Find out actually who are these people behind it. Support them. You can start with 10 rupees, okay? And you can build up more. Or you can give your time. But there is something all of us can do to um, help in the conservation, especially of birds, because we are talking about birds. But nature in general, which also supports birds. Do something yourself, even if it means putting out a bowl of water, which is very much attuned to our culture. Um, and learn more about the birds. Observe them. You will begin to love them. Shobha, on one of your podcasts, I love that story about the reciprocities that crows can bring. You know? so The genius just, of birds. Just, the podcast episode is called The Genius of Birds. The Genius of Birds. It was so moving. And we respect crows as representing the souls of our ancestors. Do something for the crows around you even. And even the pigeons who make such a mess. Look at them differently. Look at that shining blue and purple neck and marvel at their beauty. Observe, love, protect and also support whichever local conservation organization you can find. See what happens then. Then you build a thriving society that is protecting itself by protecting nature. That I think that last sentence is key is because people think we are doing a daan and protecting nature but it's really we are protecting ourselves in as you said earlier, you lose it at your peril. Yes, absolutely. It is enlightened altruism when enlightened self-interest. Nothing wrong with self-interest if it is enlightened. So let's protect ourselves by protecting the, the soil, the air, the water on which our future depends. And I'm telling you, it is the most joyful of journeys. Um, uh, Rohini, I, any last words with respect to any favorite birds that you see in your garden? Any a call to action? Any last words to our listeners? Uh, you know, I think there's a lot for us to learn from birds. So just to ask your listeners, can you spend, make a little time every day, just a very little time to just look around you for a minute a day and just look for birds. I promise you within 10 minutes, you'll see a bird. Maybe not every minute, but within 10 minutes. And just try to connect with that bird and see what happens. And if you can identify that bird, and there are so many apps now, there's so much science, easy science for us to use, so much technology for us to use. If you can identify that bird and make 
some connection with it. There's a lot of joy waiting for you. And then, then you tend to get personal and make personal stories about birds, right? So I'm, I'm firmly a believer that in my Kunur garden, there is one particular <laughs> pied bush chat that recognizes me. Now, this could be completely my ego, but I promise you, he comes and sit on, sits on my lawn chair the day after I arrive there and we have a long conversation. But so there are many joys like that and many curiosities and quirks waiting for you. And it's going to lead you. It's like a thread. So the birds are like threads that will attach you with invisible, uh, uh, what shall I say? I don't know, wings that will lift you up into an adventure with nature. So look for the first bird. If you haven't got into birding, just try it. A lot of adventure and joy awaits. Wow, that's uh, with those uh, words, uh, Arohini, uh, you're a busy woman. I know that. Thank you for taking the time to speak to the Bird Podcast. Thank you. And namaste to all your listeners. Namaste. Bird Podcast is produced by Ullas Anand and Echo Edu. This episode was edited by Tamanna Atreya. I'm your host, Shobha Narayan. Thank you for listening.